No, 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 Norm over here. Welcome to Norm's Rare Guitars podcast. And today we've got a very unusual guest, a good buddy of ours from the store and one of the most successful people in doing music for TV, films, commercials. Um, it's Jared Gutstadt from the Jingle Punks, known as Jingle Jared. And he is just, uh, you know, turned a tremendous career uh, from just doing all this music for film and TV. And um, just to show you that there are other ways to make a living of playing music. I mean, plan A usually is form a band, get a hit tune, make millions of dollars and all that. But it doesn't work out that way for everybody. So sometimes you have to think of a plan B and a way to do it and be a businessman. And you've got to be creative got to just be insistent and not take no for an answer and you just got to keep going with it and you just have to have a good original idea and that's what Jared has done and he's uh, been a customer of ours for many years and uh, he's turned a tremendous company uh, in a very short amount of time. So Jared all right. Coming back to you there, buddy. All right. Whoa, I got carried so, away there. <laughs> when, when did the Jingle Punk start? Um, it started uh, in a very, very tiny apartment in New York City in 2008. But like all beginning stories, there's even a further back story to that. Uh, prior to that, I was a TV editor working for Viacom, working for MTV Cribs, Chappelle Show. And I would, from time to time, just like sneak my music in the shows that I was working on. And that turned into me getting a dollar. <laughs> One dollar. <laughs> but, like, then I got another dollar. And ah, another dollar. professional in the music industry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I had for years tried to make a dollar in the music business by playing in bands and, you know, touring. I had everything that could have possibly happened to set the stage for a great uh, traditional music career go right uh, at the very beginning of my TV editing career, but I also had a family to take care of, very young kids, so I had to get my day job going. You know, I'd edit a few, 10 hours a day working in those buildings. Be I was the world's worst, anyone who you ask, world's worst focused editor because I had like ADD, so I could edit for, I'd get, they'd get a solid two hours out of my 10 hour a day <laughs> where I could really kill it for those two. And possibly do the work of what, what kind of stuff were you editing? What like, they throw? At they you, could or? dump seventy-two hours of Housewives fighting in front of me, oh and I could turn God. that into a solid thirty of, yeah. of Bravo Housewives. And but I realized that there was so much content being created. There was all these production music libraries that existed. Uh, I won't name their names, but you probably have all, if you've worked in the music business and thrown your music in a production music library, yeah. just to, it, to, not to sound too corny about it, but it was like the porn of the music business. Yeah. It was taboo. Giant, you make up a fake giant name. garbage cans full of yeah, yeah, but what happened was I realized there was a huge onslaught of content coming a wave, if you will, of unscripted te television because more and more of my jobs were going from scripted series to unscripted. And I was like, if you could figure out a way to make hip music work in the context of this like new world of Kardashians, American Pickers, Pawn Stars, Housewives, each of these brands would have their own sound. And that is a long way of saying that the 2008 starting in my garage on the Lower East Side, the kickoff point was really me going, aha. Uh, that's you had a light bulb that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop yeah. for a minute trying to be the next Strokes, the next White Stripes, the next Bob Dylan, because I just was born possibly at the wrong time or to the wrong parents or with the wrong you know <laughs> physical build. Something was wrong, and it that's wasn't working. That's my story, too. So, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> so I decided that maybe 
this was something where my brain and my hustle and the rest of it would be my thing as much as I love, look, I love making music and that's my passion, but I had to drive this business starting from 2008 all the way to where we are now in a way that the tour of Jingle Punks was crazier than anything I ever read about yeah. Rolling Stone 77, you know, uh, you yeah. know, the Beatles on the road. We've, I got to do, fulfill every imaginable uh, part of what it's like to be a rock star without actually having to live in hotel rooms and travel around the world like that. <laughs> Very good. And by the way, I just want to say, that's you know, you hear this British accent coming <laughs> on the other side. That's from uh, my partner, Nick Dias, Hello. who was, uh, you know, one of our secret weapons at the store. Yeah. And uh, so when you hear his voice, you know where that's coming from. And uh, he helps me along on these things. But, you know, the thing that's so cool about, you know, what Jared has done, and you, you may go, well, you know, I've never really heard of the Jingle Punks. But the truth of the matter is you've heard them a million million, million times on all these television shows, on movies, on commercials, all kinds of stuff. They figured out a way to kind of monetize this and make a business out of it. In fact, he's been so successful mm -hmm. that William Morris bought uh, a portion of his business and he's making so much money that I've heard <laughs> that he's going to start a charity and this charity is to help out elderly vintage guitar store owners. Owner. He's yeah. doing like uh, no interest charity. loans yeah. <laughs> you know, to elderly vintage guitar store owners. And that's so kind of you, Jared. I appreciate oh, you doing that. It's my that. pleasure. You guys have helped me out so under, many times. Under I like to give back. Uh, Thank under you. the pretext of what buying a really good vintage Yeah. Guitar. Oh, yeah. I'm going to invest. For work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite place to come tell, do tell to us, work. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing that's kind of cool is, you know, when you're doing all this music, a lot of it is layering and layering different sounds, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can kind of create a feeling with the music. So, I mean, you've bought a lot of odd instruments besides just guitars. You bought a tenor guitar, a national yeah. tricone tenor from the 30s. That's uh, around 1930. That's really cool. But what it does is it adds a different flavor. Well, it does two things. One is when people walk into my office in L.A. and it looks like this weird hunting lodge with animal heads up on the wall <laughs> and old guitar. It does two things. One, it makes people go, holy shit, these guys make music. Yeah. But two, it, I really do believe that there's no sound. And I don't, again, I never want to sound like I'm old-fashioned and not embracing technology, but there's nothing that can be found inside the box. Right. You know, that can create a, you know, 1960s sounding guitar sitar you know, yep. Dan Electra thing, or there's nothing that can emulate that tenor guitar thing with all the warts and all around the, the wonky it's misnotes. It's the authentic sound. Right? And look, it, it, there's important to have like a tightness to some of the TV stuff we do, but there's also an important to have a layer of looseness. And you guys from day one, you know, never made me feel like the, the cliche of when I've walked, when I was younger walking into guitar stores and they're like, uh, what do you want? What are you doing here? Like when Jingle Punks had no resume, I remember I was working on a Fox pilot and I did need that sitar sound and I didn't know how to play a sitar. Right. So you said, how about, you know, this instrument? And I didn't buy it. You guys lent it to me. Uh -huh. I'm sure you guys don't make that a, a habit. But I remember thinking, like, well, wow. You look like an honest guy. Paper you know. we like, yeah. And, and, I, and I never forgot that. And then when a little bit of success happened, my team was like, where are we going to get our gear from? I was like, only here. Like, that's like well, when it comes to Well, I remember when you first started coming in the store and we so, you explained what you were doing. And we, we all sort of got it immediately because he's, he's been a professional music you know we were all musicians in the first place yeah. and you said well i want to do this but i want the sounds to be authentic and i might need something odd i might need mm -hmm. a balalaika or a tenor yeah. or whatever and we're like oh yeah that's we get it yeah. yeah absolutely yeah well you know it's cool because i mean you want it to be organic you want it to sound real and um and again you know I, I, one thing i wanted to ask you is like you know uh, you've created a library yeah. with all this music in it and you can kind of call on that um at will or when you get a new gig and they come to you and they say we're doing a show about the housewives yeah. um you know do you immediately start thinking of how can we create that you know for this so, show or do you look back in the library and just try to pick stuff that you already have it's a mix of both because the early days like i said were really exciting when we get a show like pawn stars that you know yeah. it was like that theme song went <laughs> That thing, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that happened in the wow. most happenstance <laughs> way where I was 
coming home from my job, I, Jingle Punks hadn't fully started yet, and this lady, Krista, calls me. She goes, there's a show about these guys who have a pawn shop. It's probably not going to be anything, but they have a few <laughs> songs that sound like ACDC. And I had no library, so I sort of fudged, and I lied, and I said, I think I have something. Yeah. But instead of staying, uh, instead of, like, uh, just, like, waiting a week to turn it in, in between getting home and going to a gig that night, it. I wrote two riffs. <laughs> with lyrics and I think I wrote Pawn Stars and she goes take the lyrics out in the morning the gig is yours six uh -huh. months later it's one of the biggest shows on American it Cable was huge. but the combo at that point when you know much like we're talking about this new media universe of podcasting and digital at that time that was unscripted television and because we were affiliated very loosely with a hit show all of a sudden the phone started ringing American Pickers oh fantastic uh, yeah. the voice like it, it, it had I'm skipping steps but the most exciting part was we had really no library I had 500 tracks from 2005 to 2008 when you say track you mean uh, I mean like just 30 pieces, second 30 little second like pieces, yeah. noodles like hip hop like doof, 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 yeah. bam and That's like a, yeah. and then we'd start getting complaints Huge. from clients being like yeah these need to be two minutes not 30 seconds because we can't just loop these right so I fired up a factory in New York of this guy Jeff Peters graduated from Syracuse showed up with his resume hey I want to be an intern guess what you're not an intern you're a composer this other guy shows up he's like I just graduated from NYU I want to be you know, uh, I want to like start in the mailroom. Like, guess what? The mailroom is composing. Those people. <laughs> you got to do it all. Here's a who ended up day work. one showing up. There was one year at the ASCAP Awards where there was 15 people from our company that accepted awards. Wow. And it was almost like a virus because we it was like Hans Zimmer was there, Trent Reznor, you know, all the regular usual suspects, yeah. uh, Mike Post. Mm -hmm. And we just like show up. No, everyone's like in like rented tuxedos with like blue <laughs> yeah. jeans on and our hats and and it's the jingle post. And it, it really was, you know, from the first year that uh, that I went to the ASCAP Awards, I remember someone at my table when they played da 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 da. -da someone uh, just snarkily went, "That's not even mastered properly." <laughs> <laughs> but we were just playing catch up with the universe. Yeah. Like, I didn't know how to really, and this isn't something to admit. I didn't know how to mix or master or do any of the things we do really well now at the very beginning. Yeah. But we were building the airplane as it was but in the air. But you had the ideas and you had the drive, right? Well, yeah. there, there's, hope well there's, there's hope for you all. There's hope for you all. That's honest, what it really amounts to. When somebody says, Jared, can you, before they finish the sentence, you go, yes. yes. Yeah. And, you know, if, you know, some people yes. would go, no, I don't really do that or whatever. You're out. You know, you can't. You can't qualify turn things down. with with a negative. I always say yes it's and. It's better to say yes. You so figure did, it was, out. Was there a lot of that? Was there a lot of pushback when you, like, who are these guys all of a sudden? Yeah. Like, all this? like so the craziest thing that ever happened. So we started in New York, and I'm, the story was we were just a bunch of people hustling in New York City every day. We would close some new small show like Second Chance Chihuahua for Animal Planet. We'd go, to the bar, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. We'd get drunk and we'd be like, "We did it!" And I remember the first time Chihuahuas. American Pickers came on. I didn't know what to expect. I said, "We're going to play a drinking game. Every time one of us hears one of our cues, let's drink." Oh, everyone almost ended up in the hospital, <laughs> but because <laughs> it was like two minutes into the show. You're well, Canadian. that creates yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. Like, But uh, the best thing was we come out to LA and we're like, "Let's take a crack in network TV because cable was exploding, and all of a sudden, everyone who was popular." popular in cable was starting to get a shot to do things in network and network still was bigger royalties bigger payday right it's NBC ABC CBS Fox yeah and you're like if I could crack into that then the business will really be safe and we can all take a breather so I come out here and I move it. Hans Zimmer was a very, very small investor in our business early on. Like, I had oh, a random meeting wow. with him. That's we good take a spot smaller than this in his giant facility. And when the other composers found out that Jingle Punks was in the building, the day that I moved in and set up, I was supposed to be pitching on The Voice. And it was like that scene in Revenge of the Nerds where they threw them out of the house. I get a knock on the door from the facility manager, like, you can't stay here. I was like, yeah, but... Hans and his team said we could stay here and like do this thing and I'm on this a crazy deadline and they're like no you have to leave right now because we wow. were sort of like intrusive to the pro everybody else in the building was pitching on the voice too so other companies uh, well now they're probably asking you if they could come into your <laughs> facility you know the, those same people the point of the, that story was the hustle and tenacity so we a friend of ours his buddy was like the GM at the Viceroy so he just goes look we don't have an, have an office space and we can't use my like flop house college apartment <laughs> where like my one employee out here was staying so we yeah. went to the Viceroy how much for the room for the day and how much noise can we make? They're like, how does it work? So I showed the GM that we were on headphones, that we were doing everything with MIDI, and he goes, fine, it's yeah. great. 
so we posted up there for three days, took the meeting with the music producer from the series in the lobby of the Viceroy. So it actually made us look like we were fancier because yeah. yeah. we were like, oh, meet us in our nice hotel. Oh, our Viceroy. studio's upstairs. Well, yeah. So we, they said, <laughs> Everything here's... Everything is perception, right? And they said, this is the full circle moment. Well, here's the deal, Jared. They're like, we don't just want a composer. We want a composer and the library. And it was the first time that someone had said the thing that we were already doing, which is you're not going to be able to work quick enough, even with 15 people, yeah. to get us all the music we need. Like, it's like, hey, I'm Joe Schmo, I'm from Arkansas, and it'd be like, you know, yeah. like, they'd be like music beds. You need a production line. Yeah. And we just, instead of us making all those needs, the library went into the package side of everything. So when you meet characters for the first time, uh, that package music was from the library, and all the big stuff like dun 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 dun, the bombast, that was created season on season. And that was, you know, a huge, huge deal for us. And really, at that point, that's when you're in L.A. and you have that moment when all of a sudden someone's at, the meetings start coming to you instead of you hustling people nice. going, hey, you think we can meet? And also in L.A., there's two types of meetings you, when you meet with agents. If they say, let's meet you across the street for a coffee versus come upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like in like Moneyball, remember the well, first time I've got to get lunch do... anyway, so I might as well do <laughs> yeah. it with you guys, yeah. Well, you know, um, one thing also that's kind of interesting is you have a master's from NYU, right? Yes. and uh, Interactive media? Full, again, um, I was never an amazing student. There was people in that program that learned, you know, it was an interactive media program that taught you how to use the technology of the day to tell stories. And I wanted to go there because... I was in college, I was more interested in figuring out how Cubase worked or how to build my right. own talk box. Or I liked how to communicate using tech. Right. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. The Internet 1.0 in 2000 was about to be like, the, everyone's going to be a millionaire, everyone's going to be a billionaire. So I was like, I'm going to move to New York and do my master's. The bubble imploded, but while I was there, I learned a bunch of things. One was I learned how to learn things quickly. Like if I had just picked up, uh, I switched from Cubase to... I think I moved to Pro Tools and then I moved to Logic. Right. And I would keep evolving that learning process. But So you were on top of... Well, I wanted to... And then I also wanted to learn how to use Final Cut and Macromedia yeah. Director. And I realized that the simplicity of any communication tool, any language, it doesn't matter if you're learning Chinese or French or, or, or Logic or whatever it is, yeah. there's only a few major things you have to do in those things. It's like, how do you record? How do you play? How do you get the thing to move across the screen? And then as you get comfortable with that, fancier things like, where's the effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it taught me just quickly what those commands were of, of, of just like, okay, I could go into Macromedia Director and figure out how to animate something from this side of the screen to that. Once I've accomplished that, now I can put in another layer of interactivity. And when I left the program, I realized that I knew how to tell stories, but also be my own production. Uh, and and that saved me years of trying to find other people to open doors for me, because everybody yeah. in the music business is like, help me, help me, help me. And you can, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to help myself. I'm going to, yeah. any band I was in, I would, you know, I had my Pro Tools Digio 2 thing. That I'd pack up a duffel bag and go to my friend's loft, and we yeah. would make demos. But we were the only band that was recording everything that we did, and that became the bedrock wow. of Jingle Punks. I had... Like I said, cues, I had half-finished songs. And instead of, like, toiling over the EQ and what this is going to be, I just made stuff. And making stuff turned into, um, okay, now we have uh, the Jingle Punks business. But the technology that it lives in the Jingle Player, I said to my business partner, Dan, we need to patent this so that anytime someone searches for music for American TV, we own that space. We own the box that it's and all in. And you hold several patents, yeah. right? And full circle this year, I'm going back to NYU as the chief collaboration officer in residence for the the Clive Davis School of Music, Tisch School wow. of the Arts, and the gaming department. So wow, how sweet my, it is. My That's... first master class is going to be in wow. November. And my whole they said, what do you want to teach? I said, I want to figure out things that don't plug in together, the gaming department, the interactive department of music, and have them all talking to each other so they see things like podcasts, see things huh. like VR, see things like gaming, esports. The future, the really. Future. How do we all work together yeah. so that, you know, uh, five years from now, the next big business is maybe launching bands in virtual environments, you yeah. know, because the audience in the gaming world is so big and people are playing Fortnite. How does that become a discovery platform? Well, that's amazing. And, 
you know, I, I really, I've, I'm, pa- you see, I, t- I spark up, like, I get passionate about technology, but I'm a very old fashioned person. My musical tastes. That's what I was going to say. Very so, so basically, in a nutshell, you were, you were a, a kid who's into music. You're in a band. You're yeah. a musician. But then you saw a gleam in the horizon where, okay, if I learn to do this and that and that, and you, that's... Then I won't have to wait for people to make, to grant me with the magical wand and go, you, you're up, you know, like... Listen, kids, there's a lesson to be learned there. Well, that's that's why we're doing this is because we want to show the fans and the people that, you know, like to listen uh, to these podcasts and stuff that there are other ways. I mean, I went with Plan B, my store. I came out as a musician. I ended up selling guitars because I figured I could do that You've built an amazing brand, and you're a disruptor in this business. Like, every music history book I ever read, whether it's Robbie Robertson or reading about, like, Dylan, (laughs) like, you're in there. Like, and that's because I'm old. And that and thank you, you know, but helping you out these some. elderly uh, guitar <laughs> store owner. You provided a service, man, like a big, you know? big service to the world of music. Well, I want to just say something too. You know, the Jingle Punks have been featured at the Wall Street Journal, mm-hmm. Billboard, USA Today, Rolling Stone, Variety. I mean, this has happened in a very short amount of time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, for um, to have one of you America's guys really most uh, promising startups yeah. by Bloomberg. Yeah. Right. Which is, Can you imagine that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's fantastic. Did I mean, get, did this take you by surprise? I mean, were you, yes. like, uh, surprised by all this or just expecting it? I'm not a cynical person, so anytime something happens to us, I feel like it's the first time anything's happened. I think that that's <laughs> also a good perspective yeah. to have. Like, if you, I have friends that are really, really successful. I have friends that have Academy Awards they don't even put on display because they've had, they have so many right. of them. Or grim. If I, I take pride, it might sound tacky, in everything we've ever done. I put it out there for to remind me that we did it before because I forget. I can forget very quickly if I don't see it. Right. But it drives me to continue to think about how we can continue to evolve because I don't want to be defined by just one thing that I've done. And again, the learning how to learn thing, the biggest door that opened for us over the last few years was collaborating with traditional parts of the music business, like working with Lil Wayne, working with Big Crit, working with... Chris, Chris Christopherson working with Dirk Dirks Bentley, Dirks Bentley. Uh, like I, th- I wasn't Debbie in, Gibson yeah, Randy Bachman seriously, Dave like, Stewart man, it sounds crazy it's that, true that but like Jared's worked with. I wasn't invited into the room because of my special songwriting skills I was invited into the room because we could elevate and take songs that typically would have no life into a different world whether it's TV film or well, trailers so the jingle Jared moniker for better or worse it's you know even though it sounds slightly silly has done, you know, at first it was, hey, change the name, change the name, and then later on, you know, Little Wayne going, oh, I fuck with Jingle Jared. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I never wanted to use the my name in my <laughs> business. And by the way, I just want to say, I did get one award. It was, uh, <laughs> this sounds so crazy, <laughs> it's a... The Rock God Award. Yes. I thought they were talking about Rock Cod. I thought it was like a fishing <laughs> award. When I got up there, I said, you know, I suppose you guys want to know what equipment I use. And, uh, you know, they didn't really think that was as funny as I thought it was. But uh, I was so surprised because all these other friends of mine were getting this award. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing they do in Hollywood. But, I mean, you know, what I do is I'm sort of on the fringe of the music business. But um, what you do is you have really directed a lot of people inward yeah. and kind of given them, you know, a reason to do what they do. Yeah. Because, you know, it's very discouraging when you have intellectual property yeah. that you can't monetize. I mean, you know, you can only do that for so long and mm-hmm. then you start getting discouraged. And I've met some amazing people along the way that are some of the best songwriters I've ever met. And even I sometimes have a hard time, a challenging time figuring out where it fits. And there's two parts of my brain. It's like what's the best art you could possibly make and what's something that's going to get utilized yeah. a bunch and how can you sometimes I, I hate the word compromise but maybe meet in the middle yeah. to figure out you know I'm working with really really talented songwriters right now on this female country podcast I think you guys interviewed uh, Scarlett Burke yeah, for, yes. uh, a while back mm-hmm. she has sort of been described as a female Chris Stapleton wow, and cool. her songs are so good that when we went to Nashville, everyone's like, these are great. These are the kind of songs I would want to write. The A&R people said if we were ra- making records that were personal, but yeah. how do you get the sipping on, tripping on, beer, summer, and spring break thing in there? Yeah. And she's like, simply put, like, I don't want to do that. So yeah. I said, let's take these cool songs and turn them into a scripted podcast, which is part of this new realm of 
putting out records through elevated storytelling. But in the meantime, I said, you got to pay the bills. And since then, she's done a Taco, Beds, uh, Taco Bell spot with us that has Darren Chris in it that was seen hundreds of million times. It was the Nacho Fries okay. uh, film trailer. If you Google <laughs> well, yeah. it, it's, it's silly, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a spoof of Star is Born, and it was one of the biggest campaigns of last year. And but it's she's going to keep her afloat. And she's, she's doing, doing a, a on the heels of that because now she's known as a great jingle person. She got this big Burger King thing, which is coming out. And I'm like, did you ever think you'd be writing about these ridiculous topics considering you were described as, you know, Chris Stapleton, the you know, aspiring who, female songwriter? But yeah. she's like, look, you utilize a different part of your brain. You are, you know, it's still equally challenging. When you get a brief from an ad agency, it's like putting together a puzzle. You're taking together these disparate you know, nacho fries. How, where's yeah. the melody in that? Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and it's much better she does that than, like you said, the, taking... They're nacho songs. worse fries, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much to talk uh, about here. You know, I mean, with all these shows that you've written for, you've also uh, written for Guitar World magazine, and you've written, yeah. um, you know, for... What kind of um, stuff were you Huffington doing for Guitar Post? World? Yeah, for both, I was doing contributing columns because it was, I used to, I grew up with, you know, like the that guitar nerd who would, yeah. I lived for those magazines. In fact, I didn't let my mom throw out any of the the guitar magazines. He's like, those will be worth something Piles someday. I have I mean, some I don't know too. if they're worth, I any, I don't know if they're worth yeah. anything. But I love the, t you know, I love the little advice columns, like how to play this riff or this riff. But I, I was like, how come no one's focusing on some of the most famous jingles of all time from Adam's Family to M.A.S.H.? to, you know, even right. Bond stars. I was like, there should be, you know, commercial riff of the month. All those things that we know, Mash. that we know. So, oh, God. Doo -doo -doo. I, have a, I, have a, <laughs> I have a buddy of mine named Bruce Miller who does a lot of TV shows. Yeah. He did, like, um, uh, Becker and Fraser and oh, all yeah. those kind of shows, which were major network shows. And after the show went on for about five, six, seven years, he had so many, like, nine and a half second spots, mm -hmm. 12 second spots, things like that in his library that he could actually do a complete show in about 40 minutes, yep. do all the music, because yep. yeah. he had it all there, and he could just go, not that one, not that one, that one we'll use, yeah. and, um, you know, it, it saved him so much time. I was watching him do it, and I was going, man, how it takes you no time to do this where most people would be spending weeks on it and you're doing it in 40 minutes. And further that, a lot of people now have just their own templates of sounds in Logic yeah. where if I have my Hans Zimmer template or my... Uh, uh, you know, housewife hip hop template. I have all my instruments there, so choosing is easy. I have, I have my 808, I got my bass, I have you got my fake song, strings, yeah. and I quickly, you know, go loop it, then it's like, you know, staccato strings, and then throw my bass, and I'm done. Yeah. Perfect. Track, track, track. Just like keep it flying off the assembly. So line. as far as that goes, that's the commercial side of it. But like working with artists like uh, like the girl you were just mentioning, so, is, is that going to be a bigger part of your future? Yeah. So where it's gone is from. I call it the. Yeah. It's the evolution of the entire music business. It starts as like the Chachka sheet music business right. on the Lower East Side in the like late 1800s, early 1900s, and all of a sudden you have. It, you know, those Chechka businesses turn into the big, you know, production music. They're uh, publishers. They become sudden. publishers. Yeah. They go to the Brill Building. Then they're out in Hollywood here. And those people are now run by business affairs people at, like, Paramount or, yeah. or Warner yeah, Brothers. Yeah, yeah. I want to bring back that roll up your sleeve and make something music business where people can break by non-traditional ways. So Jingle Punks was a peek through the door of how you can reach people with music through other people's mediums. I want to create our own mediums like Bear and a Banjo, like Hipster Orchestra, like this girl's project Make It Up As We Go. And there's a bunch of them that we've sold already that are in production. And her project, you know, has one of the biggest TV show writers uh, in the world working on it. This guy, David Hudgens, who did Friday Night Lights and Parenthood, hmm. is writing the scripts to her album. Wow. So think about that. Very cool. 30 minute scripts. That accompany, That's going to so, be amazing. So he goes, "What's what am I? What are we working on here?" I said, "Well, every episode there is a song at the center of it, and it takes place in the writers' room of Nashville. And it's about a girl who can't put gas in her car in episode one, and by the last episode has the biggest country song in the world. And what is that story? And it's all told by our um, other co-producer on it, Bobby Bones, who's a huge." Uh, DJ in the iHeart world. Right. So imagine in the last episode, he goes, now we're going to listen to our fake character song <laughs> performed by Miranda Lambert. Boom. He hits wow. play and then iHeart lifts it from the podcast 
to the actual puts it air on the actual airwaves. Wow. So it's you have to I'm lucky that we have what access to different buildings. Like you go into any building when I'm 22, 23 years old like Viacom I go, "Whoa, this is big. How am I ever going to meet that guy over there in business affairs? How am I ever going to meet the music licensing uh, You walk now they're around coming and to you. Well, no, you walk around, you meet people and some of those people that started you, I think the big lesson that I learned in those years was be nice to everybody because some of the people who are answering the phones at Viacom are now the president of like yeah. major places like Fox, ABC, CBS. Everybody who starts in those buildings, it's it's really one of the last industries where um, people don't just jump around from industry to industry. Like one day someone's yeah. selling shoes and the next they're selling, you know, life insurance. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, these people that get into the business in the mail room at W at William Morris, There's the mail reason. room is that's that's the thing. You start there. That's where David Geffen started. That's where Clive Davis Clive started. Davis. Yeah, yeah, and and it, really, you just don't know who you're going to bump into along the way. So it's really important in the music business. Again, make a lot of stuff. Be nice, to Be nice to people on the way Network. Up. <laughs> say, don't just stay in your studio. If someone invites you to go see a show or, you know, to play your music in, in a live, get out of the house. Like, you know, socialize. Because yeah. the world's not going to come to you sometimes, like, you know, the way that you think it's going to. Well, we're going to take a break, uh, you know, to let our sponsors talk for a minute. But I just want to say this is so, you know, enlightening. And I'm going to have to quit being such an asshole. I'm going to have to be so much nicer to you people. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that it's, I've been a, a dick now, for so long. But uh, sorry for the bad language. But uh, I, you know... Jared, thank you so much for I'm pointing that out, out to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be nice to everybody from now on. Uh, we're so going to talk about Bear and the Banjo when we get back. Yeah, I we, get there's into a that. lot of other stuff amazing. that I want to talk about. So take us out with a little uh, ditty that you guys do. This is kind of based on um, Neil Young, or is this the this Bob song, Dylan? I'm going to play you this one called uh, uh, Can You Hear Me Now? This has a bit of a retro Zeppelin vibe, but it's uh, I'll sing as best I can because yeah. I'm just doing the Pooh Bear part. It's like... Feel like a cold shoulder Four years from the border Looking back at the future In a hurry, no, we ain't going nowhere Jared and Woo. Nick Dias. Thank you guys. Um, we'll be back in just a second, so stay Woo. tuned. A lot more cool stuff to talk Don't about. Don't you go change it. Jared playing the uh, mandolin right now. Jared plays a lot Very of different well, instruments. Yeah. He's a multi-instrumentalist. But, you know, the thing is, you don't have to be Wes Montgomery, Joe Bonamassa, any of these guys who are, like, ripping. you got to be able to just write a good tune, and you got to be able to write a tune that's appropriate for whatever that situation is mm -hmm. or whatever the product is that you're trying to promote. Yeah, I mean, when we first started, I tried to... Uh, pardon the pun, wear a lot of hats where we would write, produce, and play on everything. And at Jingle Punks, uh, almost every single person who composes and works at Jingle Punks does all of those things. But I've been lucky enough that since I you know, came out here and kind of flew the coop from the New York spot, got to watch how people like Timbaland produce, got to see how people like T-Bone Burnett produce, got to see how people like, uh, you know, you name it, like Brad Paisley. And typically... The, you know, T-Bone style agrees with me a lot, which is 
I want a great song, whether I write it or someone else writes yeah. it at this point, and I've learned to let go of the ego of the things, things that I want to do. But when I was working on this project that we're about to talk about, Bear and Banjo with him, I was like, voila, here's the songs with Pooh Bear on it and me playing on it. I would say by the end of the, the record, I'm playing on like 20 percent of the parts that I originally put in there right. and I think they left some of the things in there as a sloppy courtesy or, or hearkening back to what the demos were but we're playing with the to keep the feel to keep the well, feel yeah, but, they, and they use it as a road map yeah you know. and his players you know the the Raising Sand band who worked on the Alison Cross Robert Plant record I'm watching them come in and taking these songs and going oh my God, like, yeah, that's what I meant to do. Well, these, yeah, the, and the, the old brother were yeah. out there, yeah. soundtrack. all those guys oh, yeah. that played on and that then, and just brought those songs to such beautiful. Uh, and then I'm, on top I've of known that, known from, yeah. for a long time. And I'll tell you, the one thing that he brings is he brings an earthiness and an yeah. organic feel to an everything authentic. he does. It's you know. unmistakably these it recordings it. that we've done, T Bone, and the secret weapon was uh, Gabe from Punch Brothers would come in and finish a lot of things, so he would play. Uh, mandolin, ban extra banjo parts, extra fiddle parts and stuff like that. And on the song that's kind of the anchor and the bedrock of the project that we'll get to, and I don't want to just like name drop Dylan in this thing for a second, but the haunting... We have a Dylan. We have a Dylan. <laughs> yeah. Dylan does <laughs> our, our, our videos. You know, so. But in that Is it song, that Dylan? Or it's or not that Dylan. No, it's a different, different one. Okay. He basically, <laughs> Gabe plays this haunting, woody like fiddle part in this thing like it's nothing I've ever heard and when I was sitting there watching it I, from the demo to that I was like I couldn't if I had been left to my own devices we never would have gotten that song to where it should be and I think the role of a producer is taking something that is not even 50 that's 30% there and getting it 100 Ooh, a and, collaborative effort yeah. and I think that there's this mysterious thing the Rick Rubens of the world the Timberlands the the T-Bones what do they all do even Pooh Bear who's who's on our project and is a producer for all the big yeah. Bieber songs he's known as the best best vocal producer in the world so he can figure out how to go syllable by syllable and as I'm watching him put together phrases Again, at Jingle Punks, I never had the time, the inclination, or the skill set to do, to break down a verse into a three-hour ordeal of of just yeah, figuring out how it how it all consonant. sits. Yeah. And I'd be like, "Is that even?" As he's slowly doing it, is that even a word? What's going on here? And then it assembles like a puzzle, wow. you know, or like an old Polaroid when you like you go, comes out and you see this corner come in, that corner come in, this corner. Yeah. And I'm like, my God! So that's what a vocal producer does. My God! So that's what Timbaland does. Like, and when you put that together with someone like T Bone, who does that sonically with all his, uh, it is it's, with reverence for the instrument. It's almost like he's painting this giant canvas, yeah. like a. I think or a mural is. on a wall because every everybody does things differently. But T Bone's thing for me and how secure he is in his role of it because there can also be producers that are just like frenetic, nightmarish, get out of my way, me, me, me. He yeah. is working really, really long and hard to to do what is being accomplished sonically. But he's also at the end of it is like, hey, what do you think? <laughs> I'm, like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good, man. Well, you know, T-Bone, <laughs> T-Bone came in the store with Justin Timberlake. Yeah. This and was Oscar a while Isaacs. Back, yeah. And Oscar Isaacs. And they were doing a movie called Inside Lewin Davis, which is a really cool movie. Right. And uh, they actually wrote the main tune of the movie in the office of my yeah. store. They came in and T-Bone just got inspired and they walked into the office the next thing I know they come out with the tune and it's the main tune in the movie and T-Bone is just super he's a great guy but he's so talented and just I think these things just appear through yeah. the ether to him and yeah. he just like when it happens it happens but uh, that was an interesting day also because uh, what, you know Justin Timberlake was huge obviously and Oscar was just becoming this big actor and we thought oh here we go actors in the store <laughs> they were listening to every little note on these 30s Gibson LGs and, mm. and Justin was going, yeah, no, that's not it. I want, I want something that's a bit grittier, a bit older. And they really took their time and did a fantastic job. And you can tell, and they'd learned to play this old uh, Mason style of picking. I love it. And it was, uh, it was pretty fantastic. So you put that together with T-Bone. I love the soundtrack. And by the way, that was a the, all that stuff that he's done with the Coen brothers have been a huge... Oh, influence awesome. on me and what yeah. I've been trying to do with this project, Baron of Anjo. Um, you know, the the story of that has been 
T- whether or not Tebow knows this, a he- the, the biggest jump off is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou for me. Right. The fact that, that was you, unbelievable. You know, I do believe that America has good taste. You just have to trick them into liking <laughs> good things and movies and, you know, podcasts. And it, that's a good way. And look, Justin Timberlake, God bless him. That's how everybody now knows Stapleton because they did that duet the, yeah, at the CMAs or wherever that yeah. was where you hear, and by the way, Justin sings like a badass on that song because he's great. Stapleton's voice is amazing, but those two things together—the grit and yeah. the, the sort of urban Finesse sheen or the R and B sheen of his yeah. voice and the runs that he does—it they sat. It shows you how close these two styles of music are, black and white music. Yeah, and that's again the Ken Burns documentary. All these things have really set the stage for what I was trying to somehow accomplish with Bear and a Banjo because the jump was very simple. I met this guy Pooh Bear who's the biggest top-line writer in the world, but he writes for Chris Brown, Justin Bieber, Ed Sheeran. He wrote Despacito, the remix. So he's like got this big global pop voice. But I said, somewhere inside of there is these folk songs. Mm-hmm. And we got together and we did the end credits music for Roots, the miniseries. Mm-hmm. And as a joke, you know, he saw me picking up the banjo because I, I was just like, oh, what's the sound of this Roots song going to be? And I wanted to make something that sounded a bit more... Of that era, just right. the only old instrument I found. I just picked up the oldest thing I found in my office, and he was like, "Oh, that's so cool. We're bear and a banjo now." Before we wrote our first <laughs> song, that's "Born right. This Way," he said, "We're a band," and then we did the song, handed it into History Channel, which was doing Roots, the miniseries, the reboot. They go, "Great, can you do one more? You're going to end up doing the end credit songs for every hour that we're putting out." And by the way, the network really loves you guys. Can you guys come down to New Orleans and shoot a music video? So <laughs> within five days of meeting him. We exchange numbers, comes to my office, we do these songs, and then out of nowhere in our third or fourth session, he shows up at my office. He's like, Jared, I hope you don't mind. I'm bringing a video camera today. And I'm like, okay, for what? He was getting a documentary made about him working on the new Bieber record, Robin Thicke, J Balvin, and somehow I was one of the storylines thrown in. Keep in mind, I'd only known him for like under a month. Yeah. <laughs> and oh. he's like, we're in a band together, and we start playing songs from this 2016, which would now be the songs from Bear and Banjo. Uh, right after that, I started playing music for people, and I was like, what do you think? And every time I would play a new song that we had worked on for Bear and Banjo, it would get snatched up for another project. Steven Tyler recorded one oh. for Pro Bull Riding. And I was like, shoot, that was supposed to be for our project. Oh, I guess we'll let Steven have it. You know, yeah. like, it was one of those, like, high-class, weird, what world is this problem? And then we had another one that was supposed to be for us, and it ended up being uh, a UFC song uh, with g Easy on it. And then I said, you know, we have to, like, go one for them, one for us. And every time we'd finish a session that was a commercial thing, he we'd stick around and we'd just, like, you know, throw around some chords or, I'd, you know, pull out the... You know, a national with a so slide. So have you got to the point where you're not playing things for people now in case they well, steal them? Well, those ones <laughs> were now set in stone. So there were seven songs. Oh. Then, then I hit up, uh, through random circumstance, I had met T-Bone just I was leaving Sunset Tower and I was very, very drunk. And I went up to him, hey, I'm Jingle Jared. I'm the king of all jingles. And he's like, oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Here's my number. If you ever had anything that we can work on, let's let's do something. So I sent him the tracks. Like, These are good. Who's producing the record? And I thought to myself, I, in the response, I said, well, you should. And he goes, great. So in 2016, <laughs> 17, 18, we're working on this record where we can in between crazy busy schedules of T-Bone's projects, Pooh Bear's projects, my projects. And uh, finally, like a, like any sane person does, I go to T-Bone, when do you think this will, you know, I'm really stressed. Like, when should we put this music out? Because Jingle Punks was funding it, and I was getting some flack from my company. Hey, we've put some money into this thing. He goes, man, it doesn't matter. Good music is good music. It could come out tomorrow or, like, in 10 years or never. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no, I don't like <laughs> Well, you know, it's a real bummer, though, when you write a bunch of stuff and then you have a plan for it. And then people like Steve Tyler just decide that they would like to do your tune and oh, you it's... have to give it up. You know, what a bummer. What you a know, bu- you really live a very <laughs> uncharmed life, let's say. You know, so I realize the how dream insane of every that songwriter and musician and uh, you're whining about it. Put that <laughs> whining. Uh, <laughs> it was that. more to the point of that we were working on this collection that we thought we had a vision for. And by the way, Steven's version of uh, Hold On, Won't Let Go ended up being on his uh, country record and it's badass and it's so amazing. I think but I've heard that. Yeah. 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 And it became the theme to Pro Bowl running so anytime you watch the oh, CBS okay. broadcast. But the, I started to get freaked out because I was like, look, we'd sunk a bunch of money into a passion project for me so I start playing the demos for 
every label. No. No, 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 really? no. Like, and, and now I'm starting to feel like maybe I'm not so bright after all because <laughs> we put, you know, I thought that to me, my interest has peaked at these unlikely things coming together, which is a jingle writer, the biggest top uh, line writer in the world, Pooh Bear, and the biggest Americana, you know, classic Debo. rock producer. Should be the banjo, it's, the bear, and the bone. Yeah. Really. <laughs> and I said, this yeah. should be easy, you know, like, but T Bone explained to me that, oh, brother, Wild thou didn't just sell as many records as it did because it, people love You Are My Sunshine and Down to the River to Pray, it sold because America rediscovered that music through content. Right. Through this amazing Coen Brothers film. And that became, for T-Bone, a live it, tour. It was through content. Uh, I, I, I remember leaving the theater and seeing and seeing nearly everybody in the local yeah. uh, record store picking the album yeah. up. And they sold out well, the album you, right after the movie. You know, I, and I've always said that a lot of the public listens with their eyes yeah. more than with their ears. Right. So sometimes, you know, you do something and you think it's really brilliant mm -hmm. and and it doesn't get accepted because people just don't seem to get it. Then, you know, they see something and then they go, oh, that's what it is. And and, and that's what it is thing happened very slowly. So there's two last parts before we even get to it going out. So we have seven songs. And I'm saying to T-Bone, you know, I'm, you know, an old romantic of, you know, the Dylan basement tapes. I said, could we get, you know, a Dylan lyric sheet and us complete a song in this mysterious way? Because we have, you know, the Bieber of it all with Pooh Bear and we have you. And he goes, oh, yeah, that'd be a great idea. That's 2017. We don't hear back for a year. 2018, you know, we're, we're still, like, waiting on pins and needles. And then finally... I'm in Nashville, and I just bump into this guy, John Ingrassia, who's T-Bone's manager, and he's like, oh, yeah, I know you guys are working on the project. What are you doing? I was like, well, we are hoping to get a track from Bob Dylan or a lyric sheet. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm very tight with his publisher and manager, Jeff Rosen. Mm -hmm. Let me send the music over. And long story short was we almost had to, like, explain and audition what it was to the Dylan camp, and which is really one person, Jeff, who's the well, smartest Jeff Kramer, guy. Well, Jeff Kramer, Kramer also, yeah. Yeah, is one of my closest yeah. friends. And Jeff Rosen, though, is like kind of this like next-level genius. Yeah. Like I met with him, and in the time that I sat with him, we did we talked about everything but music. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about, like... Uh, Philosophy, religion, like we went, and I was like, man, I picked a bad week to not be drinking because <laughs> I was like, I, I, I wasn't keeping up as much as I thought I was. But uh, a long story short was, we get this lyric, Pooh Bear and I sit down at my desk, we write the song, and then the project's complete. And again, I go, now we have the Dylan thing. Does the world care as much about Dylan as I do? It turns out that um, it's still a no for most of these labels. And then I heart out of nowhere in the news says that they bought a podcast network at the same time that I'm sitting down at the very end of 2018 watching Ballad of Buster Scruggs on TV and I go, that's it! I wrote a podcast musical! Yeah, so I, I, I call... I, so that's a long way from 2016 to my couch. You were just a little of, ahead of your time. That's yeah. right. But now I went... So I, then I call up, uh, you, you know, the only person I know that's crazy enough to agree to pitch a project with me with no real script Dennis Quaid, who I met through T-Bone, <laughs> and I go, Dennis, we're going to pitch a podcast. He's like, what's a podcast? I was like, don't worry about it. We're going to figure it out on the way. And That's we, what I said. I'll actually, explain yeah. it in the car. I'll explain it in the car. So we go to, we go to CES yeah. in Vegas. All the buyers are there, and I have, like, beads of sweat forming on my forehead. I'm like, maybe I should have thought about what this is, but he walks in the room, and he goes, Dennis Quaid is here. And they're like, what's the idea? And he goes, it's like, oh, brother, but for your ears. Uh, it's like, he goes, it's like Bear and Banjo were historical characters that they don't live now. They lived in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So they were there at the Bristol session, but they were busy trying to sell, you know, uh, scams and trying to make short yeah. money instead of recording for, Hair the, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or selling yeah, yeah. like, they were saying like in the snake, it, oil, really? snake oil salesman yeah. and, and, and potions and tonics. Yeah. But they were involved in, you know, short cons. And it's the picture of history when you see you know, lead belly, you pull the photo back, 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 and there's two people that don't belong there, and it's right. Bear and Banjo, and they were there, and they were, <laughs> they, they were, had all these songs, so Dr. Q is played by Dennis, and every week he says, this song, I found this, you know, in the archives of the American, you know, Library of Congress, and here's a story about why this lines up with some sort of fake history story. So it's a bit like Forrest Gump, a bit like Oh Brother. Bill Monroe with the, with the bear in the back. And we comb the American <laughs> landscape from, we, we go from breaking Lead Belly out of jail with the Lomaxes all the way up to Canada to have 
uh, try and sell our soul at the Canadian Crossroads and meet Ronnie Hawkins to uh, wow. get rubbing shoulders with the mob and, and Sunny Liston and Muddy Waters. So it's if you're listening to the podcast, you actually will get musical history out of it, yeah. but you'll also get a whole lot of fiction and the original music every week at the so end of the episode. It's going to be entertaining. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of like... Zelig or Forrest Gump yeah. or and we've had all sorts of comparisons like when we were doing press some people said Quantum Leap because you could put these guys anywhere in history we don't really explain their age who they are where they yeah. came from but I That's am right. essentially Jay Banjo the jingle man of his era trying to make a quick <laughs> buck and Pooh is this pure beacon of all the the great blues and folk ideas and he's confused as to why I keep dragging him around and claiming that we're going to make all this money when we don't. <laughs> so it's one it's one adventure after the other. It's kind of like the you Twilight need Zone in a, in a, a duo. Bit. Yeah. yeah. There, there were some Twilight Zones that were kind of like that uh, where yeah. people were moved around the time where Abe Lincoln, the yes. assassination, they were trying yeah. to put the assassination off. They couldn't do it. But And the age you know. of storytelling used to be people sat around the radio and experienced things differently. Uh, you know, that's why I love the podcast format. That's what, you know, I got really excited when I saw that you, uh, you know, that your podcast was launching and it grabbed my attention immediately because you were very early in on the YouTube thing. And that's a fanatic fan base of very specific audience mm -hmm. that people want to get to because there aren't a lot of people telling, you know, interviewing these types of people or telling these stories. But classic rock and rock and blues still kicks ass like Bohemian Rhapsody took what, 30, 40 years to, to yeah. come to the screen, but yeah. people love that music. People yeah. love those stories, and the, and the music and the stories hold up, and I think that, that, you know, it's a complicated marketplace these days. There's so many people making stuff. I think it's really cool to go backwards and tell stories, like, you know, for that people can enjoy in their car or while they're preparing dinner or, you know, enjoy while they are just trying to go to sleep or something like and, that. And sure. the other thing is doing things like this with you, it's it's great for us because it's so interesting. People might not otherwise hear how, you know, you can be doing, you're doing something with uh, some of the big, huge producers now, but it actually started out with going, hmm, housewives of, uh, yeah. how do you write a piece of music out of thin air for... Well, you know, that. it's, so it's, that's it's, a great story. It's like a learning experience for us when we do these podcasts and stuff too. Because it sure is. one thing that we do want to do is like you know we have a lot of young people that listen to the podcasts and watch some of our videos, and we want to show them that not everybody can be like the Joe Bonamassa or mm -hmm. Wes Montgomery or any of these you know guys Steve Vai or mm -hmm. whoever it would be that are like virtuosos, but there's a lot of different ways to turn music into a career. You just have to think in terms of a business, and be able to handle rejection a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, that to me, one of the most scarring things that ever happened to me early on was, uh, look, you make something, you create something, you put yourself out there, when someone says no thank you to your face, yeah. that can hurt. And I actually, my biggest rejection was I wanted to get into voiceover, and I thought that I was good in my bedroom and be like, coming up next, like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I went in and, you know, some agent I convinced to take me on. But the lady uh, that I was auditioning for said, stop, stop, stop. No, no. She's like, who who hi, who put you here? What is this? Like, dress oh, me. Really? And I was like, oh, nice. wow. And I literally had like a fight or flight, like panic moment. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, how crazy is it that like that was 15 years ago and now we're telling stories like doing this like Baron Banjo thing where we wrote the characters, we're voicing them, there's no qualifications really needed. You Do know, you remember I, that lady's name? I don't. I, it's weird how <laughs> I, the people I, you forget. I'm not trying to cause trouble here, <laughs> but I just... Uh, the, that, but the, 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 the scar is like real, like everyone's got their insecurities. They can be very... Uh, uh, your very music is so close people. to you that, you know, hearing that some, you know, you hope everybody likes it, and there is no music that everybody likes. The Beatles were turned down by a whole yeah. bunch of people yeah. before they got signed. George George Lucas was turned down for Star Wars at every studio. Keep that oh, in mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rocky. Yeah. I mean, same story. I, I, I got turned down for a, for a voiceover doing an English because my English accent wasn't authentic. <laughs> yeah. But by the way, Hollywood loves a fighter and a, and a person that can make their own. Every industry loves people that are self-made. But I always cool. think, you know, you know, I've been talking with Dennis Quaid a lot when we work on the uh, podcast. Billy Bob Thornton and him just did a show called Goliath. I love the Billy um, Bob Thornton story. I yeah. love it. That, like, too not, you know, not handsome enough to be leading man, not... 
cosmopolitan enough to be, you know, in mainstream roles, but he invents his role with yeah. Sling Blade and all the way to the Oscars. And it's, a, and it's, they, they had their trailers parked next to each other on that production, right? And it's it's tenacity. God only knows what got up there. I it's know, tenacity. Legendary. It's like I've not giving up and yeah. having thick skin and going, I believe in what I do if you don't see it. Well, you know. I think that's the thing. If anything, we're taking from Jared's story, you got to believe in yourself uh, and not, you know, necessarily go down somebody else's path. Because to be able to just say, yeah, I can do it, is, that's a huge but I think that everybody ahead, has right? insecurity like uh, it makes you put on a mask when you leave the house to like pretend that you believe in yourself but everybody feels vulnerable about this stuff like I wear this hat basically to hide the fact that like I'm just a you know regular dude from me out. yeah from yeah. I'm just like a Jewish kid from Toronto who yeah. like grew up in the suburbs and I've reinvented who I am by just being out in LA and dressing like a you know, kinky Friedman every day, you know, the like, hat. Yeah, with the you, hat, and it becomes it, yeah. sort of like the the mask that you wear. Yeah. Well, you know, I've kind of developed some thick skin because I figure, you know, <laughs> at, at my age, if somebody gives me like a life sentence, how long could that be? I mean, yeah. how <laughs> bad could that possibly be? You're in I can pretty much man. say whatever the fuck <laughs> I want, and you know, there's, you know. There's, there's not much they can do to me at this point. You know, so, um, but tell me something there, Jared. How do people find the podcast? Yep. How do people find Jingle Punks and all that kind of stuff? So Jingle Punks is, is easy. If anyone is out there and the, you know, they just need music for projects, they just go to JinglePunks.com. The podcast right now is this week, but I'm sure a few weeks from now you'll find it just by uh, going into the Apple uh, podcast, podcast app or Spotify and typing in Baron and Banjo. Every week we release a new episode of uh, the series, but every Thursday is a new episode and every Friday is the single drop to Spotify, Apple. So we have this cool. dual release strategy. Thursday is the story, Friday is the song, and right now we're really lucky. It's We're up in the carousel for Apple. I don't know how long that'll last for, but right now we're number two That's in music great. right behind Dolly, but we're ahead of... White Stripes and Wu-Tang, and it's pretty awesome thinking that our fake cool. brand and band has uh, Well, done I, this. I love the, the fact that you've sort of done this as a concept album as well, so there's a narrative to the songs and, you know, it's, that, I always that's say a them, format that I miss because I grew up around. Simply put, it's bringing the liner notes to life through storytelling, and if Tommy came out today or Sgt. Pepper's, perhaps it would be a podcast because yeah. the audience could follow along the story. Yeah. It, it would. Know. It would. Well, I Can just want to say... For this last uh, the guitar. Jared, uh, yeah, we're going to give Jared that guitar again. I'll grab it. And, uh, you know, one thing that I just wanted to say is that, um, Jared, please say hello to my buddy T Bone, who oh, has yeah. said that he will do one of my podcasts. We're going to get him down here. And we're going to try to get, uh, you know, as many of my buddies that I've known for so many years to do this kind of thing. And I want to say, please say hello to T-Bone, yes. say hello to Pooh Bear, and my friend Yogi Bear. <laughs> All the <laughs> bears. All the bears, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure having you, and it's been very uh, inspirational and very learning. And I hope it's encouraging to some young people that want to have a career in music. Maybe they haven't figured out exactly where their place is, but, you know, there's multiple ways that you can do it. Just got to be creative of have some thick skin and some tenacity keep going with it don't take no for an answer and just do what you believe in all right so one last song perfect this what is the gone but not forgotten this is the one that we penned with t-bone bob dylan the bob dylan and pooh bear D, uh pooh bear sings it on the record but i will do my best to uh to what pull us through this is the a minor right, to g perfect. so I'm
right, guys, I want to thank you for listening to the Norm Joy Guitars podcast. Thank you, my buddy Jingle Jared, uh, you know, one of the greatest, Nick Dias, and remember that you can watch the podcast for free at the All Guitar Network the following week. The podcasts come out on Tuesday. The video comes out the following Tuesday for free at the All Guitar Network. Get your podcast where you get them. Get your uh, All Guitar Network for free at the App Store. Sign up. Thank you guys so much. And, and thank get you, the Joe. bear and the banjo. And bear and a banjo. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Yogi Bear, too. <laughs> no. 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 No.